pretty unusual. So I'll um, I'll try and be as uh, comprehensible as possible. And I'll I'll ask questions too, so we can try to get to the heart of it. Two heads is better than one, lots of times, you know. So, well, anyways, guys, let's get started. So this is a uh, Coach Castle chatting with uh, Nathan. Sorry, Nathaniel Clark, rather. And we're going to be basically getting to know your position on, with rather, your definition, rather, of God, specifically your definition, and specifically how you think religion is useful in a way that secularism is not. Because as we just know, in brief, my position is that there's no evidence for a God. All religion is man-made, and there is nothing that can be accomplished through religious means that cannot be accomplished through secular means. So if you could, please, uh, thank you very much and welcome. And I'm so pleased to have you on. So thank you. And uh, you have a book coming. So why don't you chat about that real quick? I love books, by the way. So what are you writing? Could you introduce us to yourself, your book, and then your positions, please? Okay. Um, he already introduced my name. So what I'll say is, um, as far as my work is concerned, what I actually do for a living, um, it's a little bit separate as far as how I think about things. So I'm just a regular um, uh, regular worker. I, I work on airplanes for a living. Um, specifically, I work on private jets, full streams. Um, I've been doing that for, let's see, since I was about 20, I think. Um, I've been in aviation since I was about 16. So that's kind of my background as far as professionally speaking. Um, the way in which I think about things that I think has come out in my writing is pretty different in the sense that you, I don't think anybody would think that I'm an aircraft mechanic. Um, but what I'll say as far as my book is concerned, it's, so it's, called, it, it's going to be called The Divine Dialogos, uh, The Animating Spirit of the Universe. Cool. And essentially... The premise of the book is to tie in and incorporate the premise of ultimate reality, God, and language. Um, and the way by which I tie those together is by explaining the interiority of, say, ultimate reality, God and language. Um, and by bringing those three together, essentially I'm equating the use of language, which is different from, say, like language capital L, but human language per se is intrinsically tied to the nature of reality. I know that probably sounds like an odd no, statement. Actually I, I think I know where you're going with this, as a matter of fact. I well, Leave it alone. Keep, keep going. Yes. So um, I know that probably sounds like an odd statement, but um, if anybody is familiar with Christian doctrine um, and John, they'd be familiar with the phrase, essentially, that in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the premise is that Jesus is the Word. Okay, so take that premise and then you take the idea of the Holy Spirit and then the Father, and then now you have the triumvirate or the Trinity. And then you take that idea and you compare it to the structure of reality that which we can navigate through and uh, as best as we can understand it, followed by the comparison to language not necessarily as, as as it is replicated by people, but the actual structure of language altogether, you find that there are much higher forms than will be taken into consideration. So that's kind of the basic structure for the book. Without, um, get, without getting too much into it, but I, I do think that this will actually move the conversation a little bit. I want to, I want to dig into a couple of things you just said. Um, so could you, when you're saying language, you're referring, I'm, I'm just being specific here, but you're referring specifically to vocalizing and then the vibrational tones and how we absorb and basically interpret them? No. Um, you're speaking to what then? So, so language in the sense is a very broad term. 
term in this case. So for example, um, it's a weird way of saying it, but for example, the relationship between objects physically through say like the force of gravity, that is a communication of the presence of mass. So in a sense, that is in itself a language of a sort. It is not a language per se as, like you were saying, as like a vocal sense. Um, why, why, where, I mean, I'm, I'm just getting semantics here, but why why are you calling it language instead of a, a force or a, um, well, you, you see where I'm going. So why, why do they use the word language? Yes. So the reason why it's language is because it's the outset or the outermost or most broad form of the interior manifestations of it. So for example, I compare the Trinity to that of different components to language. So the Son would then be the Word, and then the Holy Spirit would be the breath, followed by the culmination of the two, you have speech. Now, granted, that's going to be a representation of, say, like, vocal language, as, as what you were mentioning. Okay, so but, I... I so I think in this case, then, just because I, I can see this going off in a lot of directions. Yes. Let, let's just, yeah. So let's let's try to avoid that. I, I get too curious. Sorry. Let's try to avoid that. Uh, maybe a, another time. Uh, let's just keep it simple for today. So just give me your your personal definition of what God is, and perhaps if you can even elaborate what that means to you, how that translates to your life. But try to keep it, you know, in context, one kind of path. So I think the best way of explaining it, at least on my end, is not necessarily using religious terms as I think most people tend to do. What I'll actually do is I'll reference your conversation with Imran, where, and I believe he comes from uh, an Islamic background, but he mentions the use of the truth as being an appellation to God. He says, just in summary, for those of you who don't know, he says the objective truth, yes. uh, his, his, his basic of this was everything that we basically essentially, whether it's there or not, regardless of our senses, because as we all know, our senses are very fallible. We've not evolved to understand the universe. We've evolved to survive in the universe. That's very different. So we can't, that's why we have science. We don't rely on our senses. So I'm cool with that. God being an objective thing outside of everything that we can interpret. I get what he's saying about that. So just so you guys know, that's what he's uh, referencing there. Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that statement and I'll go a step further with it. So I need to kind of clarify some items before the, um, the whole is, is imagined. And when I say the whole, I'm talking about God. So, all right. So I think that it's pretty clear that there is at minimum a baseline reality that we can measure, quantify, and agree on. That reality is going to be an objective reality. Um, now, granted, uh, with the emergence of postmodernism, there's definitely the question about whether or not objective reality is even real or not. Well, that, that aside, let's just keep it to the yes. strict definition, well, your strict definition. It, yes. So... When it comes to that, that's one form. On the other side, you have a subjective reality. And, and I promise all this stuff is interlinked. So you'll just have to bear with me for a second. I'm here. So there's a, there's a subjective reality, that which kind of presides on the interior of, at least, on, at least as far as we can understand it, the interior of our mind, so like a psychological level. At that point, it is the differentiation of interpretation of objective reality. But the struggle with it is that it is equally real in the sense that feelings such as love and hate and the consequences of it are real. So then now you've got two modes 
of existence. You've got a subjective and an objective reality, two of which are diametrically opposed from one another and are almost always in disagreement. Okay, so... I mean, a simple comparison different... would be science and religion. You could just, you know... I don't think I... Okay, sure. Oh, well, yeah, um, I mean, just for sim simplicity. I mean, I'm not sure. going to be a, you know, a dick about it, but you know yeah. what I mean, just for simplicity. Yeah. So, okay, so you've got two different realities there, but the, the trouble with the two is that there needs to be some kind of conversation between one or the other. Otherwise, there would be no ability to differentiate or have a distinction between the two. So there needs to be a dividing line. But this dividing line is not only just a line of division, but it's also a line of connection, right? So it's where the two points touch. And that point is transjective reality. And that's the point that mediates between objective facts and subjective truths, we'll, we'll say. So, you would have so to even, but even, even with that, I mean, I just, I, I do not have any idea what subjective truth would even mean. Well, okay. So, subjective truth is uniform in its state. So it's, it's a homogenous substance, kind of like water. But what it isn't is something that's solid. So it takes, the, it takes the shape of the form it fills. So in that sense, it's uniform in its structure, just like water. But whatever, whatever container it fills is... Gonna, is going to vary from one container to the next. Okay, okay so, I, I, so... I can I can kind of understand this, but at the same time, I just... From my experience, people either argue religion is true, and there's definitely not many people who legitimately think that a god wrote their book. There's really not many left who think that. Or people argue that religion is useful, and it was clearly not made by a god. Your position, just if it seems to me, that... Your kind of as we reference, God would be, it seems, the distinguishing line within humans that balances them between their subconscious and the conscious reality. Or, or am I not articulating, explaining that properly? No, no, no. I'm I think not sure what your concept of God is. It doesn't seem like He would give any shit about us, or or it would, or anything else. So, um. I, th I, th I think we're kind of jumping to the gun here by by saying that. But uh, let me let me kind of if, if if you don't mind giving me the moment to kind of further explain these ideas, and then at that point we can kind of bring these things together and 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 have some kind of cohesive thought as to what it all means. Okay, if you can, though, try to give um, like relatable examples, perhaps simple relatable examples. Yes. Okay. All right, so take take the example of like land and water, right? So land would be objective reality, that which is 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 tangible and solid and firm. On the opposite side of things, you've got water, and water is going to be the subjective reality because it bends and reflect, bends and refracts light. Can we light measure? Bends. Sorry, can we measure the water and can we measure the land in this scenario? Are they, um, are they measurable? Are they demonstrable? Are they measurable? Or is one not and one is? Well, I don't. If if I was to say yes or no, I don't, I'm not. I'm not certain that that would be relevant to the the analogy here. It matter. Well, it, it does matter to me because if you can't measure one of them and you can't even determine whether or not it's real, if it has no evidence whatsoever for it even existing, then why are we talking about it? Well, hold on. So so if if you're talking about measuring. What you're doing is that you're taking the analogy of water and land and you're adding a layer. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. I, I understand what you're saying. My, my point is, are you taking, I understand you're taking two things which are completely opposed to one another, two completely, yeah. I get that, they're two completely different things. I'm just asking the question. Uh, we know that we can measure reality. You got dirt, rocks, sand, air, gases, chemicals, bonds, you, know, you can measure this stuff. I'm just asking you if your 
the, the metaphor of water, whatever that may mean, we're going to get to in a minute. But is that something that people can test, can verify, can measure, or is this something which is inherently inside of humans, which is beyond, or outside of humans, I should say, uh, which is beyond measure? Well, if you were to add, if it, okay, okay, if you were to add, say, the the ability to measure, um, okay, in in theory. Yes, but but that it it, it, it kind of distorts the it, it kind of distorts the metaphor because I'll just leave it alone. Just leave it up. But it's possible that this thing, whatever it may be, is in some way conceivable, even if not at this moment. In yes. the future, it could be measured. Yes. Okay. Cool. Then keep going. Keep going. Okay. So let, let let's say that you have you've got two different realities, one of which is going to be represented by land. Which is going to be firm and stable and, and and quantifiable in the sense of like you can stand on it, you can build a firm foundation such as a house or a building. And then on the other side of the of the spectrum, you've got water, and that is going to be your subjective reality because your water is representative of that which is unknown, the depths of the water, that which bends and refracts light. And the light is that which makes things known. Okay, so if you have the water, which is it, the unknown, essentially you have this this dualistic or binary between known and unknown, quantifiable and inquantifiable, objective and subjective. Okay, so that's land and water. Well, the, where this analogy really comes into play is that the point at which the two meet is going to be your transjective reality. That's the beach or the shoreline at which the points come together and converge. And that point is absolutely necessary. If you don't have it, what you find is that there's going to be no dividing line between objective and subjective reality. They just kind of come together and mesh as one. No, there right? are people There are people like this, perhaps. Schizophrenics, for example, somebody with brain injuries. Would you agree with that, or is this something else? Uh, well, that would be that. If if you're talking about because there, mental, I mean, there's certain well, medical conditions where they're unable to distinguish reality from fiction, and the two blend simultaneously. Yes. Would it would it be something like that? No. I mean, I'm and, not trying and, to compare in a negative way, but I mean just the the, yeah. the blending of the two. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's going to be that, that's going to be a mental disorder, and that's and that's what distorts reality all to the point where you can't tip up. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so there would be no capacity. Well, okay. I guess, I guess you could say that, that, that the lack of beach would be something of a mental disorder per se. So, all right, fair enough. But just trying to make it a little more, you know, touchable, yeah. you know? Yes. So, so, so shoreline essentially is going to be your transjective reality, which mediates between land and water. So not only does it make a dividing line, but it also connects the two. Okay. So, Say, for example, that beach were to disappear, okay? What happens is one of two things occur. Either the beach disappears because a barren wasteland comes through, so the water essentially disappears altogether, and now you have desert. This land, yeah. On the other hand, if the beach disappears, it's because of inundation or flooding, right? So the water well, takes- The land would still be there. It would be underwater. Well, it would be seabed. Okay. So, so essentially, you've got you've got two you've got two different. If you don't have the beach, you either have land or you have water. There is no capacity to have the two. I mean, I feel like we're pushing this metaphor, but I see where you're going. Okay. Okay. So, so here you have three distinct. You have three distinct modalities of reality. You've got objective, transjective, and subjective reality. That's going to be your three modalities of reality by which we can navigate and we can attempt to understand and we can work in, okay? I'm, I'm still, still, waiting for, still waiting for God, though. I still don't get I that. Know, I know. I'm working on it. Okay. The, the, the stories that we tell are this transjective reality, which can mediate between objective and subjective realities. Oh, oh I got, okay. I got it. Okay. I got it. Um, can, I, can I please? I, I think I got it. Yes. Okay, so this, the, well, I mean, I, I'm speculating here. I could be wrong. So it seems to me that 
I mean, I, I don't really want to use the word subconscious because that doesn't seem entirely accurate. Um, but can I use the word subconscious though? But you kind of know what I mean. Yes. Okay. So subconscious, we all have all of this massive amounts of information inside of us, all of this uh, information passed down forever, all of this genetic material, this DNA, this interlocked instinct, all of this past knowledge, etc. And then, of course, we we are going into the future. And as you're born, you have to establish some kind of a right way to live your life. The stories that are told throughout religion are these correct ways to lead you down the path, be it your, your morality, your soul, to be a good human. These stories and the way that they're told have an impact on our lives in a dramatic fashion, basically. So the the product of morality is a byproduct of the scripture i'll say that uh, and i'll have to uh, okay so well, I, I, actually me, get, I, I get that but my question yeah. would be then do you think we did not have morality before we had religious texts well that question okay all right bro. can can i can i go into the question of what is or who is god first yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I can answer that. Okay. So you've got three you've got three realities: objective, subjective, and transjective reality. Okay. They're not since since they have a way in which they interact with one another. They're not independent or isolated entities, right? So they interact with one another, and essentially, what that means is that they're connected. So there's a substrate which glues these realities together. So it's almost like a matrix, yeah, right? All, all there with you. Yep. Yes. All right. So you have a ma essentially you've got a matrix. Well, so we'll compare this to we'll compare this to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. You've got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all incorporated into one Trinity. The Trinity is going to be essentially your matrix for for the individual components of God. Okay, so so then essentially, if you've got three realities, all of which are connected, then there has to be an inherent grand unification of all of them together. Well, that grand unification, as I said, is going to be this matrix, this substrate that glues it all together, that is incorporated into the body of ultimate reality that acts as the ultimate for all things underneath it. It pre-exists existence. It predates being capital B all together. Okay. That's gonna be your God. Okay. Your God is that which is the fundamental essence and presence of being, existence, and totality all at once, which incorporates objective, subjective, and transjective reality that we on the human level are injected into. So we can participate in okay. and act as as models of the reality by which we exist. That's your definite. That's going to be my definition of the presence and 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 totality of of, of God is that. Okay, so I I actually have no problem with that definition because I mean I don't. That's if you want to call God that I'm I don't have an argument. My issue would be. Why does anybody care? And why couldn't we call this God any other thing? Could be any other name. Why does it have to be called a God? Why does anybody care that this thing exists or does exist? And of course, humans are made of carbon. It's the most, com like literally the most common thing in the entire universe. Everything we know of is made of carbon. Everything we know of literally has different variants of intelligence. Everything we know of builds and creates structures. I mean, think about ants. There's bigger ant cities than there are human cities. I mean, there's everything that does this and follows these processes. We're just animals. We're, we're just doing what animals do. Nowadays, humans are actually creating in their own. I mean, you could even say this. Humans are creating a God right now. What is the Internet? It is a collective mind of all humans that is slowly merging over time. You, I mean, think about AI. These are much more useful, likely efficient gods that you should actually think about because they affect your life. Why should I care? I mean, I'm not trying to be rude, but why should anybody care about this God? And what possible function or utility does he have? Why must he be called God? Why you get these kind of questions? I, I think you see where I'm going with this. So, but do, you know what? The simple answer for this: Do you pray to this God? 
Yes. What are you expecting from the prayer? Is it is it self-reflective prayer? Is it looking for an answer within oneself? Or is it actually expecting an external force to act? Um, when it comes down to it, to brass tacks, I think, at least in my life, my prayer doesn't often look like, what can I get? Um, I don't see God as a genie in a bottle. If I, if I could, just I, I don't want to get personal, but if you could, could you... I, I don't pray, but I mean, I do things like prayer. I meditate, yes. I sit, I self-reflect. I think about how I can do better. I think about my mistakes and how I can prevent them in the future. I plan for my future. I mean, I, I really consider these things to be a version of prayer if you want to get semantical about it. So, I mean, what would a, a, like a version of you, you praying kind of be, I suppose? And is there any expectation from it, if that makes sense? Um, so while... While the discussion of prayer is kind of a, a, a rabbit hole discussion from what we were previously talking about, I, I don't mind. I don't mind um, adding into. Well, it does. Um, it, it does matter a lot, though, because if, if you believe that there's a external force which is uh, interacting on your behalf because you're beseeching them, that that has a lot to do with your stance on religion and God. I mean, at least in my opinion, it has a lot to do with it. So when it comes to when it comes to prayer, at least in my life, um, now granted, this, the prayer, much like a story, is going to be a, 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 a essentially like an internal or maybe even external, depending on if you say it out loud. But it's going to be a dialogue between you and the divine. And in my life, that's probably going to look different than say somebody else's, that which is which goes in line with what I was previously talking about, but. In my life, if, if we were to discuss what the actual, say, order by which prayer happens is the mornings that I wake up, I'm thankful for having being alive. There are moments by which things have happened that I shouldn't be. Um, I've been in multiple motorcycle crashes. Um, I've had guns pulled on me by police officers. I've been held at knife point. Um, this is normal life, though. I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but I live yeah, in Florida. That's yeah, a normal thing. No, 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 it, it is normal life. That's a normal um, I mean, thing. Yes, I mean, my, my, my dad was... <laughs> my dad died from a bicycle accident, and and and, and here I am. I, I, I survived a lot of these, what other people would consider more extravagant ways to die. I, I so, had a friend die. I had a friend die from a paper cut. He was a United States Marine. He was heavily decorated. He literally died from a paper cut. It, it happens. Yes, yeah. life. So, it's chemistry. So, in 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 my mornings, uh, I do the best that I can to follow up with a prayer of thankfulness, followed by a prayer of guidance, um, of which kind of transition from one to the other. Now, throughout the day. Um, Sometimes I do better than other times, but I, 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 I try to incorporate a prayer life which is directly correlated to the actions and, and circumstances of the day. Okay, so that's going to be different day to day, so I can't really elaborate much on that. No, that, that makes sense, though, yeah. Um, now, I'm married, so I'll, I'll, I'll include this in there. Um, but like when my wife and I eat at our house, we will essentially alternate prayer between the two of us. Now, the way by which the two of us pray over the food is different, but in general, it's 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 the it's the participation that makes the difference. Okay, so there's that. And then at nighttime, my prayer life looks something like a Asking for forgiveness for my failure to live up to standards. And those standards, they're not necessarily always religious standards, but they're just standards of living all together. And those standards can be seen throughout religion everywhere. It's not a matter of, you know, Christian doctrine per se. It's just a matter of like, hey, forgive me for having not lived up to the standards by which I should. And, uh, and, and if I may, and if I may, just, I really could say that too. If I may interject here, so I mean, I don't, I really don't hear you doing anything different than I do, except you're calling it prayer. 
So, and, and yeah. the, I mean, you can ask, ask my girl. I mean, at the moment, every time I see her, I tell her, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. I appreciate this. Yeah. You know, blah, 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 blah. Every client I have, thank you, blank, blank, blank. I'm very polite. I'm very grateful. I've also had a life where I've been pretty screwed over. I've had nothing most of my life. I've really had no backing or support from anybody. So you get used to being alone. You get used to being broke. You get used to these things. So now when I'm doing good like now and hopefully better in the future and so on and so forth, I never forget where I come from. I never forget all the mistakes that I make. I never forget how I unintentionally hurt people. I always, I don't want to say I ask for forgiveness, but I remind myself, don't do that again. You know, when you have a conversation with somebody and it could be good or bad, but you walk away and you're like, man, I wish I hadn't said that. That was so like, this, I didn't have to say that. That was so unnecessary. Or you're like, it was a bad conversation. You're like, man, I should have said this. And you're self-reflecting. That self-reflection is what makes you a human, as a human, far better. People who don't self-reflect, they're not as good. People who do self-reflect, they tend to learn from their mistakes a lot more. They tend to be more polite to other humans. They tend to be more, all of these things. Again, these are all benefits you can achieve from so many different things. So I have no disagreement. Again, with, I literally do just about the same thing when I'm meditating, where I'm just sitting in my chair thinking about my life. So I, I guess, again, just to kind of get to the heart of the matter here, um, would you mind, I guess, because I feel like we're not really getting anywhere. Again, I, I'm not really having much disagreement, but that's because it seems to me that by your definition of God, it takes him out of the picture, essentially. And then regardless of whichever religious scriptures you follow, you're doing your best to live a moral life, self-reflect, and be a good person. I mean, regardless of religious, uh, whatever, whatever it may be, or even your belief in God, I feel that you're doing these things. Anyways, you don't, you're not doing these things because you believe your God is going to punish you, do you? You're, you're doing them to be a good person. So, um, you, so essentially you're bringing up the morality issue. Mm -hmm. And I think I should probably practice. Uh, so I'll also say this. You say that I'm essentially taking God out of the equation, and that's just simply not the accurate case. Because essentially, I'm equating God to reality. And, and I, I'll, I'll make this point to kind of bring things together. The Bible, or at least the biblical corpus, is not a library of books that establish morality. So that kind of goes in absolute contradiction to what the last gentleman Imran had said, where he said that the that religious texts were writings that prescribe the difference between good and evil. Well, to, and just, um, just to be clear, I believe towards the very end there, his, his position was that religious scriptures are beautiful, poetic, and they teach in story form very beautifully the difference between bad and good and how to get on that path. But he also agreed that there was no reason that they had to necessarily be religious scriptures. So I would probably make, uh, not probably, I would make the counter argument that religious scripture, specifically in the biblical corpus concerned, is not a text or a aggregate of texts which prescribes morality. It just so happens that morality is a byproduct of the text that's written. What I mean by that is that the biblical corpus is a text that prescribes the understanding of the fundamental precepts of reality altogether. So let me let me explain that a little bit. If you go back and let's say that let's say that you were to look at the Genesis story and 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 for the sake of discussion, let's not look at it literally. Let's look at it symbolically. Okay. So essentially you have the creation of all things and what you found once the Hebrews became established was that the mitzvot or the Jewish laws that came into practice were all or at least most of an attempt to symbolically participate in the creation story. Okay. For example... You've got six days of creation, seventh which are, day. Which are, which are, by the way, completely out of scientific order, but okay. Well, but that doesn't matter. 
So you've well, got it does because it's not it's not physically possible for it to happen in that order. Well, you're thinking objectively, and 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 you're and you're entirely forgetting the capacity to 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 think of things from an unknowability. So there needs to be this capacity to mediate between that which is known and that which is unknown. If you think about things objectively, you're going to completely forego and miss that which is on the other side of the spectrum. Okay, on so the so other hand, so if so you so only so think of things symbolically, if you only think things that way, you're going to forget the fact that objective reality exists. No, I, 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 can understand, I can understand that position, but but again, I uh, just because I only have about five minutes here left, uh, yes. I, and I'm probably going to have you back on to talk more about this, as a matter of fact, if, if you're okay with it. Um, but let's try to keep this simple. Uh, so so here's here's my thought process, because I've been told almost in exactly those same words that argument before. And it's any time I bring up the concept of the soul or the afterlife or any of these other things. People say, you're thinking about it objectively. You're thinking about it scientifically. You have to acknowledge that there is a flip side to this, that there is another thing that nobody could possibly have knowledge of, but it's there anyways. I mean, basically what you're saying. My counter to that is, and again, this is however you want to look at it. I've been through many, many different drug trips of all kinds, everything from high, high doses of ayahuasca, multiple ayahuascas in a row, um, just about any drug you could think of, including like toad venom, um, DMT, you name it, massive dosages, intravenous, again, you, you name it. I have seen all kinds of unusual, strange realities, dimensions, crazy things my memory of these things is obviously horrible distorted human brain hides and it, i don't trust my own memory of these events of course but i'll never forget the things that i've seen uh, well anyways my interpretations of what i remember of the things that i've seen but i would never once even for a single second claim to know anything about those things that i had seen or experienced and i would never do anything except look at them objectively. I wouldn't say this is definitely a different dimension. I, I don't say that this is God. I don't say this is the afterlife, but I don't say any of these things. I don't know what it was. It was very profound. I mean, some people call it spiritual, but it was very profound. Uh, I, I have no way to look at the world beyond objectively. And objectively doesn't mean using my senses because my senses are retarded. They're stupid. They're very valuable. Even to identify base reality, I have to use science. I can't use my senses because they suck. I got to use science. So this, you have to be objective and keep, I don't know how anybody, maybe I have a different kind of brain, but I don't know how somebody can think about these kinds of concepts. I have no ability to do so. Because if I was to start thinking about these concepts, I would have to start it, like literally just saying I know things that I don't know. And I don't do that. I say, I don't know. That's why when I think about these things, it's always in the context of that's really cool. What could that be? How we, how can that blah, 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 blah. But even when I have, let's just say, useful experiences and I come back and it really makes me change my life. And I've had a lot of these where I've really changed parts of who I am because of these experiences. I don't do it because of the experience and I don't do it from what I saw during the experience. I do it because it makes the most sense with the information I have that I was refusing to look at, if that makes sense. But again, for me to have a conversation about something that's that is somehow out of our ability to like to, to touch to the out of reality, even to have a conversation about things in reality, I have to talk about science because my senses suck. So I have no idea how I could possibly talk about something that I don't have words for. I don't know if you've ever done any uh, uh, high trips or anything like that, but I don't have words for these things. People ask me to explain them. I, I don't know how to articulate. I do a horrible job articulating. I try, but people don't understand. So I've had people ask me, what did you see when you died? And I'll tell them what I remember from the experience, but that's it. And I have people ask me, well, what did you see during this, that, and the other? And I'll say, this was the experience 
badly remembered because my memory sucks, but I don't know. The issue I have is when people say that they know things that they have no way of knowing. So how how do you know what like how are you thinking about this this realm that I I have no ability to think about? I'm un, I'm incapable of thinking of it without saying that I know something I don't know. Yes. So there there comes a point in time where all of us, whether we're secular or we're not, where we have to come to a point and say these are the bare constraints of our intelligibility. These are the bare constraints of our consciousness. And we have to say there has to be something beyond. And even if we don't, there has to be some kind of acknowledgement that we don't know everything. And that's yeah. not a re that's not a religious principle. No, of course not. That, but my issue though what... is when religious people take it the next step. They say yeah. there is an afterlife. There is an afterlife. There is well, a God. There is a well, soul. Well, now, on that point, you're talking about an eschatological discussion, which is different from what we were previously mentioning. So I, have, I, have, I literally I'm sorry, I, I apologize, but I literally only have one minute left. Okay, um, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, let's try to make up. something. Yeah. All right. So so if you have if you have I'll go back on the idea of the, of the biblical creation story with because you mentioned morality. The laws in which were incorporated into he, into Hebrew civilizations, many of which were for the participation in the creation story. So, for example, six days, one day of rest, right? What you found was that they had very unusual laws that followed through. So, for example, one of the laws that they had was that your farmland could not be tilled or harvested at the outset. Okay. In that sense, it is a participation, again, in the six days creation, seventh day rest. Same thing is true about their garments. We look at the law and it says something along the lines of you cannot sew the outside of your garment and that it needs to be frayed on the outset. Well, again, it's the same principle as acting out the creation story. So in that sense, they weren't looking at it as maybe as though it had literally happened because their participation in it was the principles that had arrived from it. No, I so get like that. I that. the creation story, whether you believe it literally happened or not, what you find is that the rules, laws, and regulations that came from it derived themselves from that story. And so in that sense, it's not a matter of whether or not it objectively happened. Again, it's this transjective mediation between whether it happened or it didn't. They were able to mediate these things in a way by which they said, we are going to participate in as much as we can, the fundamental reality by which we can perceive. And then that will be the byproduct of morality. Well, and yeah, that's I, I, I don't have any prop I don't have any problems with that. But again, so where the moral I, structure comes from. The moral structure does not come from an idea of good or bad per se. It stems from our understanding of is and is not. But even I mean, we got we gotta we have to we'll carry this out another time, I think. But but even in the structure of morality, I will just say all religions have basically the same morality, but there are some, yes. but there are some extremely big differences between the religions. There yes. are eighteen thousand different concepts of gods. There are eighteen thousand different religions that we know about. All of them are, by, by the way, quite a few of them are so insane. I never bring them up because people don't even, don't even, they wouldn't believe me. Um, but it's besides the point. The reason I go against Christianity and Islam primarily is because those are the two most destructive religions. So the two religions where it is clearly evident that our morals, all any human being in the world, except for people who strictly follow those religions, have far better morals than the people who follow those religions. Both of those religions, both Christianity and Islam, have backwards structures of morality. The vast majority of people who follow those two religious texts, they do take them literally. Those two texts 
have been taken literally since the dawn of their creation, except about the last 200 years where people started cherry picking bits out of it, started, ex oh, science explained this, so blah, 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 you know, the guard of the gaps argument. But I still see no reason whatsoever to have any need for a religion, any need for a concept of God, because they don't interact with us at all. All of our morals that we have, our modern morals in modern society, have advanced in spite of religion. Religion specifically tells you lots of things. Like it specifically tells you. Uh, Christianity, for example, I love making this point. If you're a good Christian, you should have slaves. Because the Bible tells you to have them, it tells you how to get them, and it, Jesus never said no slaves. So if you're a good Christian, God told you to get them. So you should have slaves, but we don't have slaves because our morals have advanced in spite of it. it. It's not useful for anything anymore as far as I can tell. I understand religion was useful once upon a time. The vast majority of what is in the Bible, for example, I could totally get on board with like... A thousand years ago, that would be like wisdom to me. All of it would be wisdom. But nowadays it's not. It, it has no bearing on now, no bearing whatsoever nowadays. There's not a single moral action that a religious person can take that I myself as an atheist cannot take. And all religious people are atheists to the concept of another person's God. You don't believe in Zeus, I presume, or Poseidon. You know, so you're an atheist to those gods. I just take it one step further. I say there are no gods. And if you want to define your garb uh, semantically is the, I don't want to be like rude here, but as the eternal fabric of reality, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to word it nicely, but as the thing which is before all known, which is kind of holding reality together and permeates everything, if that's your concept of God, I, I have no trouble with that whatsoever. But I, I fail to see where religion comes into this and why it would be useful in any way whatsoever that I, I can't do secularly. I, I still don't, I'm still not getting that. But I mean, regardless, I, I got to end right now. The client in literally one minute. Sorry. No, but can we, um, no. just so I, have, I have no time. Sorry. Can, um, can I email you? Let's just, let's have you back on soon. Let's just have you back on soon. Yes. Up for it. Thank you so yes. much for coming on. I'm sorry to end so quickly. It went a little longer, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to rewatch this a couple times, see if I can extrapolate some more stuff from it before I talk to you next, and maybe I'll have a better understanding of how to, to ask the questions, maybe. Okay. Thanks so much for coming on, and I hope you have a great day, brother. Yeah, you too.